I love cooking and I'm in it to win it. I don't do things in halves. You have to have more than a passion for food. You have to have dedication and you have to practice. I want to win this competition. To win this would be a great achievement. Come on, guys, you need to have an eye of a tiger and a roar of a lion. We need some hustle and bustle. Welcome to the most famous kitchen in Australia. This is Celebrity MasterChef Australia. It's like going to the Olympics. I want the gold medal. It began with 18 celebrities, from politicians to sports stars, all with a passion for cooking. You don't make mistakes in this show and win. But to survive, they had to impress three of the food world's toughest judges. Dig deep. You can do it. Oh, my God. Get your skates on. I am getting my skates on. Has she bitten off more than she can chew? I'm going to give it a red hot go, so watch out. Woo! Give me a push up any day of the week. What are you going to say about this dish? This looks like spew. I'm thinking to myself, uh oh, I should have done a pork chop. <laughs> Along the way, they've tasted both disappointment and victory. I'd eat the whole thing if you put that in front of me. That is delicious. That is one hat territory. Yay! I want the recipe off you. I have loved every moment in the MasterChef kitchen. It was such a rare treat to spend that amount of time doing something I love. But time to go home and run the state. Over nine weeks, the hopeful amateurs have cooked culinary wonders designed by the heavyweights of Australian cuisine. Please welcome Tony Bilson, Stephanie Alexander, Matt Moran, Kylie Kwong. They faced the toughest challenges. The Crockenbush is coming to get you. They are torturing us. And enormous pressure. This is not an easy place to work. If this was my kitchen, I'd be kicking your butts. And now it's down to the final three celebrities. Yes. This is going to be one hell of a competition. Kirk Pengilly, the rock star who's also a crowd pleaser in the kitchen. This is Michael Breaker. Rachel Finch, Miss Universe Australia, with the skills to match her beauty. I want to prove to Australia that I can cook. And Eamon Sullivan, the Olympic swimmer with the golden touch for desserts. I'll do anything to win. Tonight, three challenges stand between them and the ultimate prize. The ride of your life starts right now. They'll face off in a taste test, go head to head in the invention challenge. Who thinks of that? And finish off with an epic pressure test. This is where the competition's going to be won. For the winner, $50,000 to the charity of their choice. I'm here to win this thing. And the title of Australia's first Celebrity MasterChef. 10 weeks ends now. Here we go. I'm Kirk Pengilly. I'm a founding member of the band In Excess. I've made it all this way to the finale. I must be OK at cooking. That there is exciting. I won the signature dish. It's really, really nice. I won the pressure test. It's the first bomb Alaska that we've had. The Christmas dinner, where I teamed up with Eamon. You're through to the next stage. It's an immense feeling getting recognition from the judges. Kirk, you listen to me? You need one? The Shangri-La challenge was a nightmare. Shit! But I did it well and they loved it. That scallop, that tortellini was perfectly cooked. That was kind of a real high coming out of a real low. Kirk Pengilly, welcome back to the MasterChef kitchen and the finale of Celebrity MasterChef. How are you feeling? A bit nervous, yeah, but uh, just elated that I've made it through to the final. So let's introduce finalist number two, Miss Universe Australia, Rachel Finch. 
I'm Rachel Finch, Miss Universe Australia. Thank you. This competition has completely blown my mind away. I've never done this before. It requires focus, attention, love, passion. Rachel, congratulations. Thank you. What is that? To get to the finale, we had to make a chocolate swirl croquembouche. The croquembouche is coming to get ya. I've been on stage in my bikinis in front of millions of people, but this was tough. I'm struggling to find anything wrong with it. What will you do next? You continue to surprise and amaze us. If the ingredients go my way, yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> if the challenges go my way, maybe, just maybe, I can win. <laughs> Rachel Finch, you're standing here in the finale of Celebrity MasterChef. You said you wanted to prove to everyone that you can do more than just model. I wanted to show another side of myself. Not just that I walk out on a catwalk and I'm a human coat hanger. I wanted to show that I can cook, I can think on my feet, and I love to do what I do. Let's meet finalist number three, Olympic swimmer and medalist, Eamon Sullivan. My name is Eamon Sullivan. I'm a professional swimmer. I think the point when I realised I was a genuine contender was when I pulled off a dessert. I'm excited. And then another one. We love that pavlova. It sort of made me feel like I had a chance at going all the way. I think the turning point for me was being in the kitchen at Attitude Restaurant and being in the bottom two. It made me realise that I had to pick up my game if I wanted to stay in it till the end. I couldn't be happy to be here. I've had some, some good dishes and some bad dishes, and uh, this is make or break time. This is it. You've got to perform. Eamon, welcome to the finale. Congratulations on making it here. Thank you. Will you win? Well, I think the thing I've learned over my career is that instead of focusing on the end result, you focus on the process along the way, and that's something that I try to take to my whole life, and I'll be taking to the kitchen today. Kirk, Rachel, Eamon, this is the finale you fought so hard to reach. Now, just the three of you remain in contention to win that title. So what are you playing for? We're talking about that hugely heavy trophy and, of course, $50,000 to the charity or charities of your choice. So, Kirk, who are your chosen charities? The Eye Foundation, which I'm an ambassador for. I've had a pretty interesting eye history, nearly went blind. Uh, in my 20s with glaucoma, and I felt a real affinity with what the Eye Foundation's doing, their research into eye health, and my partner Lane's foundation called Aim for the Stars. And Rachel? My chosen charity is the Australian Heart Foundation. And why is that so special to you? My grandfather passed away of cardiomyopathy, which is a heart disease, and my eldest brother also suffered with cardiomyopathy. And Eamon, your chosen charity? My charity is Swim Survive, Stay Alive. Uh, it's an initiative by the Royal Life Saving Society of Australia. Uh, it's to promote the awareness of child drowning. And this was close to you for a very personal reason, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, when I was younger, I rode into a pool on my tricycle. I think I was four. And uh, I was lucky that my dad was around to jump in and, and pull me out. So it's very close to my heart. And I'd, I'd never thought about it until later in my life and, and the recent drownings. You realise how lucky some people are. And all kids should learn to swim. Yeah. Right. It's the finale. We're at the pointy end of the competition. This is the bit that counts. Here's how it will work. Three rounds, and in each round, you'll be fighting it out for points. <laughs> Whoever's got the most points after the three rounds will be the one that will take the title of Australia's first ever Celebrity MasterChef. Kirk, Rachel, Eamon, the ride of your life start right now. There's one thing you need if you're gonna make it in the world of food, and that's the ability to taste. <laughs> and so, we head to the first round. The first challenge today is the taste test. <laughs> oh, okay. I love the taste test. I loved watching it on the original MasterChef. And I think I've got a, you know, a pretty good palate to sort of tell what's in a dish. So let's introduce the dish that you're going to be tasting for the taste test. 
The dish is a classic. We've all heard of it, we've seen it. Hopefully the three of you have eaten it in the past. It's prepared by a chef who has a passion for Spanish food. He's one of Sydney's best chefs. He's one of Australia's best chefs. He is none other than Sean Connolly. I'm Sean Connolly, head chef of Astral Restaurant and Sean's Kitchen. What I love about Spanish cuisine is the colours, the flavours, the ingredients. It just all comes together and represents the Mediterranean for me. As soon as I see the large flat pan, I knew straight away that it'd be a paella. Sean Connolly, welcome to the MasterChef kitchen. Thank you, Gary. Sean, what exactly is the dish? This is a, a, my classic uh, version of uh, paella. Paella is just a classic Spanish dish. But you speak to any Spaniard, his mother has her own particular recipe, and there's hundreds of different variations on this dish. Right, guys, it's time to have a look at what you'll be tasting today. I left the lid on the pot and the colours and the flavours were so beautiful. They were all jumping out at me and it just, it looked like a piece of art. Kirk, have you ever cooked a paella before? I have. You have? Is it similar to this? Um, it smelled similar. Rachel? I've done it once before. It definitely didn't look like this. <laughs> Eamon? Never cooked one before. There are 25 ingredients in this paella. So it's really important that you look, you identify, you taste. Stay focused, be positive, so you can win this thing. In front of George and I are 25 ingredients, all of which are in that beautiful paella by Sean Connolly. You will each get the chance to taste the paella. Name an ingredient correctly, and you get one point. We are going to cap the maximum number of points that you can receive as an individual at 10 points. Name an ingredient incorrectly, and you're out of this round. Kirk, it's time to rock and roll. It's time to taste. Okay. Kirk, lots of ingredients that are completely obvious when you look at it, but are they? Tell us your first ingredient, Kirk. I'll start off with the obvious, um, mussels. They've just got a knack at making you feel on edge and feel a bit nervous. It's so obvious this muscles just say, yeah, you're right. It's bleedingly obvious. Muscles. You are correct. Black muscles are in the paella. Well done. Rachel, please step forward and identify your first ingredient in the paella. You could taste the, the mixture of ingredients, the spices, the saffron. Everything in there was in one spoonful. So you've got 24 ingredients to choose from now, and you're choosing... Prawns. 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 Of course they're in the paella. Well done. Eamon? Step forward and taste the paella. Rice. Rice. Rice is sitting right there. It's the base of the dish. Is there rice in the paella? Yes, there is rice in the paella. Kirk, this is your second taste. Calamari. 
Of course, calamari is in the paella. Chorizo sausage? Definitely an ingredient. Yes, chorizo is in Sean's paella. You have 20 ingredients left to choose from, Eamon. Go for crab. Crab. There are crabs in the paella. Well done, Eamon. Congratulations, you've all got two points each. Kirk, step up for another taste. Lemon. There is lemon in the paella. Well done, Kirk. Clams? Clams. Could be clams, could be pippies, George. Could be <gasps> pippies. No, they're smaller. Are they pippies? Oh, shit. What's the matter, Rachel? They're pippies, I think. Yes, they are Ooh. clams. Well done, Rachel. So I pick up my next choice. I've seen it right from the start. I know the smell, I know the flavour. Thyme. Can you taste thyme in there? I meant to say, ah, oh, no. <laughs> I miss it. Well, you've named thyme. <sighs> Let's find out whether thyme is in the paella. Blurted out the wrong word, and uh, as soon as I said it, I knew I was wrong, but it was too late. <laughs> Eamon, there is no time in the paella. I, I stuffed it on the most simple herb that I use all the time. Eamon, you've picked two ingredients correctly, so you have two points out of a maximum of ten in round one of the finale. That's one down. <laughs> Now, it's down to you two. It's a double header, Kirk against Rachel. I felt more confident now that there was only Rachel and I, so I'm starting to play a bit more strategically. So I thought, well, I might as well tell it what it is. Rosemary. Rosemary. There is rosemary in the paella. Well done, Kirk. Tomato. Are you confident? After Eamon's experience, no. <laughs> when I cooked it, I used tomatoes, and that was a basic recipe. So surely Sean put tomatoes in his. <laughs> there are tomatoes in Sean Connolly's paella. Well done. There's 10 ingredients down, 15 to go. Parsley. Parsley is in Sean Connolly's paella. Well done, man. Red chilies is my next guess. Red chili. Chili, paella, it goes together perfectly. Kurt, do you think chili's in this dish? I think there might be a hint of chili. Okay. Chili, of course, comes in lots of different guises, doesn't it? Maybe it wasn't chilies. Maybe it was capsicum with a chili flavour. Mm. Yep. Oh. <laughs> there are red chilies, and it's in the guise of harissa, which is a chili paste. They play on your mind so much. That is so nerve-wracking. We're halfway through the ingredients, and it's neck and neck at five points each. Capsicum. There is capsicum in the paella. I'm going to say green beans. And there is green beans Yay. in the paella. Garlic. There is garlic in the paella, well done. Saffron. Ching ching. Fish. Kirk, there is fish in the paella. I know you don't like the word hope, but I hope <laughs> there's onion in there. Do you know your onions? I think you do. Well done. There is 
diced onion in the paella. Well done. Eight points each. This man here is seething. He can't believe that you are running away with this race. Eamon, what a disaster. It's one word for it, yeah. Seven <laughs> ingredients left. Kirk, name that ninth ingredient. Salt. Salt? Chorizo salty, George. Very the harissa salty. Seasons. Harissa. Would Sean Connolly put salt in his paella? Salt is in the paella. It's flake salt. Rachel, step up. Kirk has thrown down the gauntlet with nine points. There's six ingredients left. Wow. I'm a little bit unsure. Um... Water? I think that Sean would have mixed the saffron and the water and then used that as a, as a stock. <laughs> there is no water in the paella. And I'm out. Oh. <laughs> Rachel? Water, a legitimate choice, but in this case, some, you've got to think like a chef. Would he put water in that paella? I wouldn't. George wouldn't. Sean didn't. Ugh, at least I got eight points. I'm happy that I'm up there and it's, it's, it's almost ten. Good try. Thanks. But join uh, Eamon <laughs> in the naughty corner. Rachel gets eight points. Uh, six points more than me, which isn't a total nightmare, but... At six points, it's going to be hard to make up. Kirk, it's down to you, buddy. Step up. Let's see if you can name the tenth ingredient. <clears throat> well, I guess the obvious one next is stock. So. <laughs> stock is in the paella. Well done, Kirk. That's ten points. <clears throat> That's the maximum amount of points you could have got out of this round. You've set yourself up to win. And you two... Oh... Your work's cut out for you now. Rachel, you're not too far behind, but Eamon, two points to ten. Being in last place is somewhere I don't like to be. I'll take it, use it as motivation for the next challenge. Let's find out what the remaining five ingredients were in Sean Connolly's beautiful paella. Hamon from the Black Pig Chicken. Really? Smoked paprika in there. The land of Spain is definitely all about the rabbit. Olive oil. Round one over, round two's next. Bring it on. I know now that I've got a massive battle ahead of me. I'm going to have to cook some great dishes, hope for some slip-ups, and uh, focus on making some good food. End of round one, the taste test. Eamon, you've scored two points. Rachel, you've done slightly better with eight points. And right out in front, on ten points, is Kurt. Congratulations. Excellent performance. Thank you. You know, I got the maximum points you can get for round one. It's really important for me to hang on to my lead, so I'm, I'm just really determined to give it the best shot I can. Our second finale challenge is an old favourite of ours. You may not think the same. The second round of the finale is... The Invention Test. Last time we did the Invention Test, we had a partner. So now we're on our own and... Whew, pressure is on. And for the first time ever, it is purely a dessert. Invention test. 
It's a bit daunting. I've seen Rachel make desserts and she's really good at it. So I think she's going to be the one to try and beat today. This is the way the invention test is going to work. You'll go into the pantry, you'll see two core ingredients. You'll each get to choose which of those two core ingredients you want to cook with. Plus, you can choose 20 supplementary ingredients to make amazing, stunning, spectacular sweets. OK, now the moment of truth. Let's go into the pantry and see what those core ingredients are so that you can make that beautiful restaurant style and impressive dessert. Let's go. You've all got a really difficult choice to make right now. A choice of what core ingredient to go with that will hopefully give you that advantage going into round three. The first core ingredient is... strawberries. <sighs> Immediately drawing a blank, I have no idea what I could do with strawberries and if the other ingredient isn't something that I can use, I'm stuffed. The next core ingredient is chocolate. Mm, yummy. Mmm, yum yum. Big decision to make. Kirk, what's it gonna be? Strawberry or chocolate? I just can't really think of anything to do with the strawberries, so uh, I'm going to give chocolate a go. Eamon, you've got a lot of ground to make up. What's it going to be? Strawberries or chocolate? I'm going to go for chocolate. I've got a lot of ideas in my head and I've got nothing to lose. I'm just going to have to go out on a limb and put all my eggs in one basket and cook something amazing. Rachel, what's it going to be? Chocolate or strawberries? I'm going to go with the strawberries. They're in season and they are tasting their absolute best right now. And the boys are both going to do chocolate, so I want something different. I've been labelled the dessert queen and it is a lot of pressure because they're expecting me to give and present a beautiful dessert that not only tastes good, but looks good as well. Eamon, you've picked the chocolate. Come over and collect your ingredients. I'm going to make a chocolate delice. Almond flakes, almond flakes. A chocolate delice consists of numerous layers, a biscuit pastry base, a cream brulee layer, a chocolate mousse layer, and then a chocolate glaze layer. Milk, eggs. Oh, really I'm making a strawberry brevoire with a strawberry oh. syrup and a chantilly cream. Sugar. Ooh. Sugar. I've chosen to make a flourless dark chocolate cake with raspberries dipped in chocolate raspberries. floating in a raspberry coolie. The flourless chocolate cake is a lot denser than uh, a cake with flour and it's very rich. I think it'll please the judges' palates. So, simple. You'll cook an amazing dessert, we'll go in there and taste it, and then we'll score each dessert out of 10 points. That means there are 30 points in total available for you to win. Some of you need all those points. Eamon. It's the finale, it's round two. You have two hours and your time starts now. The first thing I do when the challenge starts is start my mise en place. So I prepare everything, I measure out all my ingredients and I begin making my bavoir mix. There are a lot of elements that could go wrong in my dish. I've made the separate elements of this before, but never have I tried to construct it in what I'm doing today. The big question is, will I get it done in two hours? I don't know. I'm going for broke. I'm going to use every minute of that possible, and uh, hopefully I can serve it up on the plate. What are you making? Making a biscuit base for my, uh, my dish. Yep. It's a chocolate delice. It's a biscuit base with a cream brulee layer, and then yep. a chocolate mousse layer covered in chocolate. Chisel with a bit of uh, white chocolate okay. and then serve with a vanilla cream. Ah. Have you made it before? Parts of it. Oh. You're combining a couple of 
quite skillful elements here. Are you going to be able to bring that together? Well, that's that's the challenge of the day for me. Pastry, so brulee, glaze. So, so far behind, I've got nothing else to try except <laughs> something Pull out a big gun. <laughs> exactly. I really need to make this dessert special. I'm not going to get any closer by doing an average dessert. I'm going to put it all on the line here and go for broke. So you've got lots of points where you've got to cook, cool, cook, cool, cook, cool, which means you need time in between that. How yeah. are you going to get it done? Oh. Magic. Mate, you have picked a big one. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. <gasps> shit, 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 shit. That's... Rachel, what's happened? It's like a volcano. I know, I just spoiled my <laughs> Oh, you scolded it, haven't you? I know, sorry. What is your dessert? I'm making a strawberry bavoir with some strawberry syrup on the outside and dried strawberries poking out of the top with um, some cream, chantilly, next to the strawberry. So it's bringing strawberries and cream onto a, a nice restaurant style plate. It's a classic mousse. I mean, I, I remember making that at trade school. Yeah. Know? That's the plan, but okay. can we get there? Fingers crossed. Thank you. What problems do you see in this uh, dish? Um, the bavoir falling apart, um, mm. not having enough time for it to set properly, and the strawberries not being dried properly. Sounds really beautiful. Good luck. Kirk Pengelly. Tell us what the dessert <clears throat> is that you're doing. It's a rich, dark chocolate cake. Ooh. Dipping some raspberries in some chocolate. OK. With uh, vanilla cream. So you're making a cake? Yeah. With some whipped cream yep. and some raspberries. So that doesn't sound too hard. Yeah. How long is that going to take you to do? You've got plenty of time. But the cake takes about 90 minutes in the oven. It's a really yeah. slow cook, so I've got to kind of get cracking. Have you made it before? Yes. How long is it taking you? About three and a half hours. Three and a half? <laughs> what? what the hell are you doing three and a half? Well, I was doing it slowly and, you know, it, it was sort of with uh, friends. Were, and, were there a few bottles of wine in between? Yeah, yeah, all that sort of oh, stuff. Oh, OK. That well, but I'm pretty sure I can cram it in. We've only got two hours, so it may have been the wrong choice for me. I don't know yet, but I've really got to work fast to get the cake into the oven in time. Now, Eamon here, he's doing a super complex dessert. He's probably got four or five elements in this one tart or delice. Do you think he's bitten off more than he can chew? Oh, my gosh. This is huge. Texturally, if you can pull that off, It'd be fantastic. it will be amazing. You know what, though? Be this beautiful. is what I love about Eamon. He's the true competitor. He's that far behind. He's pulling out all the stops to make himself a winner. 30 minutes down, one and a half hours to go. Kirk! You need to get that chocolate cake in the oven. It takes 90 minutes to cook. You're running out of time. A little over 30 minutes is up, and I finally put the main cake into the oven, but I also pour some of the cake mix into a couple of little um, containers as a safety in case the cake doesn't work out. So I figure at least if I have a couple of little ones there, I'll be able to present them, and hopefully they won't know any different. We'll just have to wait and see. While the pastry base is resting and my cream brulee is in the oven, I start preparing a chocolate cream for the mousse. As soon as I start folding in, it looks beautiful. It's chocolatey, it's smooth, there's no lumps. It looks great, exactly what I was hoping for. With less than 90 minutes to go, I start making my chocolate dipped raspberries. I've never dipped raspberries in chocolate before. A few weeks ago, I tried dipping orange in chocolate and it didn't work at all. So. I'm a bit nervous. I pour my bavoir into my moulds, and just before I put them in the fridge, I think to myself, they're too runny. It was like a strawberry milkshake, when it should have been a thick, rich custard. I know they're not going to set in time. So it's back to the drawing board. I have to go back, measure my milk, whisk my eggs, whisk my cast of sugar, and begin the whole process again. It looks like you're making it all again. What's happening? Yeah, exactly. I've done this process before. So what, what's in here? The gelatin. And uh, the um, milk. Right. Can't boil gelatin. Oh. When you boil gelatin, it compromises the property of the gelatin. Start again. I would change it, personally. Divide that recipe by four and make one very small amount and set two of these, put this in the freezer and give yourself a way out. Always good about having a plan is having a good plan B. semi fredo Okay. Gary suggests I do a semi fredo but I really, really want to make my bavoir. So I start again, but I make a smaller version. So I start boiling my milk for the third time. You have one hour to go. And when we talk about being a competitor, this is what we mean. The concentration, the skill, come on. I'm doing really well. 
I've got the chocolate mousse mix in the fridge, the cream brulees in the blast chiller, and next I move on to the caramel sauce. I'm getting really worried because my custard is still not the consistency that I want it. Gary comes around and realises that more or less I've got scrambled custard. 80 degrees, that's all you need to take it to. You've boiled it, so it's scrambled. Okay. So I think we need to go to our good plan B, our semi fried out strawberry, and hope that they set and freeze, which they have. How long did they take to freeze, just out of curiosity? About 10 minutes. Wow. 10 minutes. You know what you've got time to do? Is take that mixture and add more of this, which is your coolie, all right? Yeah. Taste yep. that. Taste it. Play yep. with that recipe, right? Bung it in two of those. Get that tasting beautiful so it tastes like strawberries. Add anything else you want into to make it spectacular yep. and freeze it. And I'm looking forward to your semi fredo of fresh summer strawberries. Okay. I decide to start one last time on my bavoir. I really, really want a plate of bavoir because that's what I came here to do. But I don't know if I'm going to make the time. Guys, you've got a half an hour left in the second round of the finale. Don't give up now when you're so close. You never know, you just might come up with something brilliant. With half an hour to go, I'm starting to get worried about the chocolate cake. Initially, it rose really high, and now when I look in the oven, it's sunk right down again. I don't really know what that means, but, um, yeah, I'm starting to get worried. At 30 minutes to go, I decide to pour six moulds. I put two in the blast freezer, two in the normal freezer, and two in the fridge, hoping that I'll spread my chances out so that one of them will be fine. You know what, George? Kirk and Rachel have buckled under the pressure of this finale challenge, the invention test. Let's be honest, Rachel's first attempt at bavoir is not a bavoir. She can set them into a semi fredo and freeze them, which means semi-frozen, or if they set in the fridge and there's a lot of gelatin in there, they're gonna be like little squash balls. So I got my fingers crossed for that second batch. Kirk, he's doing this chocolate cake basically with raspberry coolie. The problem is, is he gonna make this chocolate cake into a restaurant quality dessert? It's a bit pedestrian. You've got to do something special. I'd, I'd rather see something layered, you know, where he takes in all those beautiful little raspberries, something that's really delicate and gorgeous. Now, whether or not this big chalky cake is gonna deliver that, that's another question. I decided to check on my little chocolate cakes and I pull one out just to test it. I cut into it and the top just cracks and falls in at an angle like this, <laughs> meaning that there was sort of the top and then a whole pocket of air and then the sort of the chocolate cake mixed down the bottom. Not good. But the other one looks good. I just don't know if it's going to have a pocket of air between it and the cake as well. Uh, we'll have to see. When I think the chocolate delice are set enough, I use a blowtorch around the side of the tin carefully so that I can slide the tin off and dress it with the chocolate glaze. I'm running out of time. I think I've cooked the big cake long enough, so I run it over to the blast freezer to hopefully cool down really quickly. You have 10 minutes to go in round two of the finale. Don't forget, guys, there's 30 points each up for grabs in this round, and some of you definitely need them. So, Kirk, is your cake be ready in time? Um, I have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. Mini versions. Yeah, that guy there. This is a pretty simple dessert. It's got to be the presentation has got to look I know. spectacular to keep you in the lead. Yes, I understand. I shall do my best. I take one of my earlier bavoirs out of the freezer and use a blowtorch to apply heat and, and get it out of the mould. And I am ready to pick that thing up and throw it at the end of the room. I am so frustrated. Hello, Rachel, Matt. how's it going? Ugly? So, trying to make a bavoir. Why um, is it not setting? Not setting, too runny. Well, what happens if it doesn't hold? You gotta... um, well, I've got some frozen ones here. So right. I was thinking of doing like a strawberry ice cream. Yeah, smart idea. Finally, I decide to plate up a semi fredo. This is the best I can do considering the circumstances and that everything hasn't gone the way it should. To 
put the glaze on the chocolate delice, I put them on a wire rack and pour the chocolate over the top so it drips all over the delice. Once the chocolate glaze is where I want it to be, with the white chocolate I've melted, I'll put it into a piping bag and uh, drizzle that over the top of the chocolate delice. It's looking great. I'm pretty sure I've cooked it all really good. I'm starting to get really excited. Have you been possessed by some strange French pastry uh, chef? What's going on? Oh, That's spectacular. The underdog coming out of me, I think. Yeah? Is this was like a chocolate delice? Yes, those were the test runs. They look great, Amy. That's really good. Thanks. Guys, you have five minutes to go. You've really got to be putting these desserts on the plates now. If you're not thinking about it, oh, my goodness, you're in trouble. Come on. I'm really relieved that the cake's held together. It looks good. I decide to still try two. So if the main cake doesn't work out, I've got my little ones safety. The final touch for the chocolate delice is one by one, very carefully placing the roasted almonds around the side of the delice. I'm picking almond by almond, making sure they're full, they're not cracked. I want it to look as good as possible. Guys, you have 60 seconds left of round two of the finale. Come on. Come on, Rachel, dig deep. I'm plating my dish. I put my strawberry syrup on. I'm just stressed because nothing has gone the way I want it to. My bad foie hasn't turned out, but this is the best I can do. I really just hope they like it. I'm trying to plate two up at the same time. I realised that I probably should have put it all on a bigger plate so that I could actually spread it out more. They both look crowded. You have 10 seconds to go. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's, That's it. it. Step away. Oh. Well done, guys. Brilliant, brilliant effort. So walking into the restaurant with my flourless dark chocolate cake, I'm just hoping they like the presentation. Kirk, can you smell the title of Celebrity Master Chef? Yeah, definitely. I mean, is it in your grounds? We've got one challenge to go, and after this challenge is judged, we'll all have a really good idea of, of where we're all heading. OK. Well, I think we should dive in. Kirk, I look at that and I go, it's going to be a good chocolate cake. It's dense, it looks moist, and it looks dark. I like chocolate cakes like that. Chocolate dipped raspberries. I sort of look at them and I go, ooh, that's a bit naff. But then I eat one and go, I could sit in front of a big bowl of them and just eat them away. Presentation. Very home economics year 11. <laughs> It'd probably look better in a Tupperware container. <laughs> the issue with this dish is it's cramped. It looks crowded. You, you, you can't really get to appreciate each of those individual elements. It's a dessert that tastes like a restaurant dessert, but it's not plated like a restaurant dessert. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kerry. It's my turn next. I'm second up, and I'm not feeling that confident. A semi-fredo is meant to have the texture of frozen mousse, and mine is, like, rock hard. Rachel, you got to pick the core ingredient and create your own dessert. How did you find the experience? The worst out of the competition so far. You never know, but it might taste amazing and blow our socks off. Because you've done some really beautiful stuff. Your crock and bush was phenomenal. I know, so why did I ruin this, you know? Like, I just, I'm angry because I had the opportunity to do something that I usually do well, mm. and I tried something different, and I didn't do it as well. Oh, it's, it's hard, it's frustrating. Rachel, it's not what you intended to put in front of us, but we're going to taste it and score it on what it tastes like. OK. I think what you've done is you've picked beautiful sweet strawberries and you've captured all those flavours 
in two principal elements on that plate, which is the semifredo and that coolie. That's to be commended. What I don't like about it is, it, although it sounds really mean, it's basically a beautiful popsicle. It's not a disaster. I don't eat it and go, oh, that's disgusting. You can't eat that. But if you gave that to 10 kids with sticks in it, they'd love it. No, but they'd love it. They'd absolutely love it. So the whole point is you put something up that can be scored, that can garner some points. OK? Thanks. It's my turn to take my dish to the judges. I'm feeling nervous. I'm feeling confident, but you never know with these three. They have such a sensitive palate, they can pick out the smallest flaw in any dish. Eamon, this is a huge leap from that beautiful light chocolate mousse to here, something with multiple processes, multiple textures. Was that your thinking, to try and do something spectacular that might gain you some ground on the other two? Yeah, I felt like I had to get the whippersnipper out to get out of the weeds and uh, pull out something big to, to try and get some points back. It may be a disaster. You may cut it open and it could be a fiasco and it could all come tumbling down. Yeah, don't jinx me. So, George, please do the honours. <sighs> Eamon, I kid you not, that is one of the top three desserts I've had this year. That is absolutely stunning. Well, the only way I can describe it to the layman, it's just like the softest, meltiest, lightest Mars bar you've ever eaten <laughs> in your life. That is unreal. You know, I think for all of us, we've had moments here at MasterChef, but I think this is a food moment that the three of us... One of the best. ...will never forget, because it's an absolutely beautiful dish from a guy that didn't know the difference between rosemary and thyme to a guy that's pulling this out of his hat. You, you, you're a freak. <laughs> the one thing that dish could have lacked was the crackle of a brulee top, but those almonds provide not only that textural difference. It adds a complementary flavour that ties in with the saltiness of the caramel and ties in with the chocolate. It's the sort of dessert that you can see coming out in a three-hat restaurant and going, oh, this pastry chef's pretty good. And that's freaky, coming from a man who swims for a living. <laughs> but Rachel is six points ahead of you. Kirk is eight points ahead of you. So a lot depends on not only how well you've done, but also on how well they've done as well. Kirk, Rachel, Eamon, we've tasted your invention test desserts using the core ingredients of either chocolate or strawberry. We've each marked your dessert out of 10 points. That means in this round, there are a total of 30 points each. Let's look at where you stand at the moment. Kirk, you're in the lead on 10 points. Rachel, you're snapping at his heels with eight. Eamon's lagging behind on just two. Rachel, I scored your dessert. Five out of ten. Not your greatest work, not what you wanted to put in the plate. And really, although there was flavour, there wasn't texture. And it didn't look amazing enough for the finale. Mm -hmm. I scored your dish. Four out of ten. Rachel, five out of 10. Lucky enough, it's only round two. What happens in that final race is the one that counts. Rachel, you've got eight points in round one, 14 points in round two, giving you a current total of 22 points. I'm used to trying my hardest at everything and being the best at whatever I do. I know I could have done a better job, but I'm happy that I did something. Kirk, the number to beat is 22. You're on 10. 
Still feeling confident? Um, yeah, hopefully I can do better than 22. Um, Let's see. I scored your dish... 7 out of 10. Kirk, I scored your chocolate dessert... 7 out of 10. I scored your dessert... 8 out of 10. Oh, God. I'd hate to play poker with you. <laughs> You tell us you don't do desserts? <laughs> Come on. Flavour, spectacular. Delicious, yummy. But that presentation just ain't for restaurants. Hence why you lost two points from me. But well done. Thank you. George gives me an eight. I'm kind of surprised in a way. I guess, you know, it really is about taste. Kirk, at around two, You've scored 22 points from the three of us. That gives you a total of 32 points. Fantastic. How do you feel? I'm really happy, yeah. Well done. Thank you. Eamon. Whoa. That's a score to beat, isn't it? 32. Big task. What do you think of your chances? Just hoping I get more than another two points. <laughs> I just want to double my total. Well. As we always say, it comes down to taste. We have tasted your dish, Eamon. I scored your dish. 10 oh. out of 10. Wow. Eamon, I scored your dish. 10 oh. out of 10. Eamon. I gave you 10 out of 10 as well. Oh. Oh. <laughs> wow. Three tens. The first time on MasterChef, let alone Celebrity MasterChef. I'm speechless. I don't know where I pulled this from. We have had better desserts in the MasterChef kitchen. They've been cooked by Matt Moran, Katrina Canatani, by the great chefs of Australia. They've not been cooked by contestants. That is a freakishly good dessert from a freak of a swimmer who's also a freak of a pastry chef. <laughs> Unbelievable. Eamon, you sit on 32 points. Equal first place with Kirk. I would love to take out this final round. Coming from two points to 32, it would be something that I'd savour and, and remember forever. You three are amazing cooks. You've done some amazing stuff in this competition. I can't wait for the next round. So round three. So close now, so close. But there's one massive hurdle that stands in your way. The pressure test. I love pressure tests because I love following a recipe and I love being told what to do. So let's look at what the pressure test is. Remember. Same recipe, same time limit, same ingredients. There are 30 points on offer here. We taste your dishes and we each mark them out of 10. I can taste the win. I can just taste it. So close. There's one final hurdle and uh, it's not going to be easy. So the question is, what is the dish that you're all going to cook in this last and most important round? It's a dish made by one of the hottest chefs in Australia. His restaurant, Cutler & Co, was recently named the best new restaurant in Victoria. Please welcome Andrew McConnell. I'm Andrew McConnell. I'm the chef owner of Cutler & Co in Melbourne. And today I'm preparing the final pressure test for the Celebrity MasterChef. I've cooked for 20 years and traveled and worked overseas. The dish I'm preparing today is very challenging. I'm really looking forward to seeing the celebrities, you know, give it the best. You well, thanks for joining really us. Good. Hey, mate. George, how are you? Andrew, Matt, how are you doing? Andrew, the guys are desperate to know what they're all going to cook today. Please show us. Roast chicken with braised artichokes, broad beans, and a burnt butter sauce. Yum. 
chicken, vegetables, fresh, fresh ingredients. It didn't look too hard to make, actually. Andrew, this is a finale. The whole idea this has got to be a tough dish. Roast chicken. How hard can roast chicken be? Unless the chicken perhaps isn't cooked in a usual manner. Oh, no. Uh, yes. What is that? It's roast chicken baked in a salt crust with hay. Hay with chicken? I mean, who thinks of that? <laughs> the crust creates a, a pressure cooker. As the chicken bakes, it steams its own juice, along with a hay, which imparts a really lovely, subtle barnyard flavour. And the resulting chicken is moist, succulent and very, very juicy. This dish succeeds or fails on this moment when you cut that pastry crust, you know whether that bird is perfectly cooked or whether you have a disaster on your hands. It's as simple as that. <laughs> I think we should have a look. Wow. When we carve the bird, the meat should be completely moist and succulent and just cook through. Andrew, what issues do you think our celebrities might have with this dish? First off, I'd have to say that the, uh, the, the salt crust, there's no perforation or tears or holes so that no steam can escape. While this is cooking in the oven, you'll be balancing and juggling four other recipes. What? No. We've taken the leg from the chicken, we've boned the leg, we've rolled it in some pancetta and trussed it. We've also got artichokes that are cooked in a method called barragul. We have a sauce made from burnt butter and also, hiding underneath, a pureed sauce of potato and garlic. I'm freaking out just inside because this is unlike anything I've done. Right, guys, shall we taste this beautiful creation? I was going to dig in. You should have. Absolutely incredible. Um, the chicken literally just melts and slides down my throat. It's so moist. <laughs> that saltiness from the bacon over the, the thigh, the garlic from the sauce, and then the burnt butter sauce, this works perfectly together. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it's moist. Um, it's a miracle. A miracle. Yeah. Wow. Degree of difficulty, Andrew, what do you reckon? I'd give it a 9.5 out of 10. In my eyes, I'd give it an 11 out of 10. <laughs> it's a challenging dish. Andrew's going to hang around, be staring down from the balcony, looking at what you're doing. You can, at a crucial moment, raise your hand and ask for help. Remember, there's a maximum of 30 points that you can be awarded for your dish. So for you, Rachel, this is your chance to catch up. For you, Eamon and Kirk, this is your chance to romp away into the lead so nobody can catch you. Study time is over. You have two and a half hours to duplicate Andrew McConnell's beautiful recipe. This is the round that could make you a celebrity master chef. Your time starts now. Time starts, I feel sick, and I get stuck into making the pastry. The first thing I do is get my ingredients out and start making the salt crust. To make the salt crust, I mix flour, rock salt, table salt, eggs and water. There is a heavy silence in the room and you can tell everyone's concentrating because this is the challenge that'll win the competition. I am 10 points behind Amon and Kirk, so to win this challenge, 
I've got to perform at my best and somehow the boys have got to do really bad. So I'm under a lot of pressure right now. Before you wrap the chicken up in the pastry, you have to remove the legs and cut off the wingtips. And I've done it before. I actually learnt uh, how to cut up a chicken when I was about 18, I think. I season the cavity with a bit of salt and a lemon wedge and some thyme. Thyme, not rosemary, thyme. Chicken. Here I come. Because I'm at the back in this challenge, it looked like I had my pastry out before uh, Rachel and, and Eamon. Eamon, you're looking busy? Yeah, it's something I've never cooked and something I'll probably take home with me and try again. And this is absolutely critical. I mean, this is going to go into the oven for 40 minutes, isn't it? That's right. And of course, you can't, you don't know until you break that crust. You don't whether know if or it's cooked or not, yeah. Chicken is cooked. Is it ski? Yeah, tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, you can't, you've got to make sure you've got no holes because it needs to be perfectly sealed. Good luck. Amy, good luck. Thank you. Rachel, where are you up to? I'm just deboning the chicken as we speak. You've made the dough? I've made You're the dough. You've not rolled it out yet? Not yet. Wow. The others are, are well on their way. Oh, well, when you look around. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen? I don't make the time. Uh, oh, that's fine. <laughs> and you have been guilty of yeah. really running the gauntlet okay. and only just getting ready Maybe just I'll in time. Maybe I'll roll it out now. No, no, don't, no, don't change. Don't change your plan. If you've planned it that way, you go for it. We'll leave you to it for a minute and uh, see how you go. Thank you. The pastry is falling apart in my hands. I can't get it on top of the chicken without pieces falling apart, holes forming. Uh, it's a disaster. The salt Eamon, and crust. are you having problems with the salt crust? Yeah, it's all sort of come apart. Have I put too much flour in it? I think it's been just overhandled a little bit. Right, okay. Yeah. So do it again. Andrew makes the comment that I might have overworked my dough. So this time when I make the, the crust, I don't knead it as much and I start rolling it out straight away. Kirk, you look like a sculpturist, don't you? I managed to get it pretty well sealed, tearing off some pastry in, from place, other places and patching up holes. So we're going to flip this baby over. Let's have a look. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. That was a sigh of relief, mate. Okay. In it goes, I guess. Uh, it's it's broken hole. away here. I look over, and the whole back end of the pastry is torn open. I've run out of pastry. Though. We'll make a little bit more if you need to. You know, you can make a little quarter recipe. Good luck, man. This is my second attempt at trying to wrap the chicken in the pastry. It's not any better. There's pieces falling off, there's massive holes. I've tried to patch it up with other pastry I have lying around, but nothing is working. Big fail. I didn't work it enough this time, apparently, and now this one's falling apart even more. Is there any way you can salvage that? No, it's too crumbly. Why not? Like... I chuck my second lot of pastry out, and I start on my third. I am freaking out. I'm thinking this is over. I have spent so long on making this pastry, I don't think I'm going to have enough time to finish the dish. This is probably the, the most I've ever felt like quitting in this competition. As I start folding the salt crust over the chicken, holes start forming. So I use my dough that I've kept aside to, to place in the little holes. I make a half batch of the pastry very quickly and put it over the... <laughs> patch the holes, basically. George, I never would have thought making a salt crust could be so problematic. We knew that this little exercise was going to test them, but, gee, they're finding it hard. It is hard. I mean, you know, it's, it's that whole touch and feel of dough, and if you haven't worked with it before, it can be quite unusual. But, look, Eamon's on his third attempt. He's at a really critical point of the recipe to make sure it's all patched up, to make sure there's no holes, get it in the oven and get moving on, because there's lots of stuff to do. Lots to do.
So my third mix is looking a lot better. It's a lot thicker. As I pull it up over the chicken, it's holding together a lot better. But as I start trying to pinch it together to form a seal, it starts falling apart again. I am about to cry. I am so frustrated. This is my third effort. Andrew, 45 minutes are down. Where do you think they should all be right now? And are they on, are they on track? I think at this stage, I'd be pretty worried if I didn't have my chicken in the oven. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Which order would you do it in? I'd go chicken yep. in the oven, which they've done, then get straight onto the thigh. And none, nobody's doing that? No, not, not, not Eamon, not Rachel, and not Kirk. That's a bit of a concern. I just want to finish this challenge. I've never quit anything in my life. I get all the holes covered as well as I could, all the ones I could see. I'm hoping there's none I couldn't see, and I get the chicken in the oven. I use a mortar and pestle to grind up some lemon zest, white peppercorns, fennel seeds and garlic. And this is going to make a nice paste to wrap in my chicken. And now we're down an hour and a half to go. This is your last hour and a half in the MasterChef kitchen. Come on, guys. One and a half hours to go and I check on my chicken and <laughs> there's a hole in the crust. So I decided to get some extra crust that I had left over and patch it up in the oven. Andrew told us not to open the oven at all when it was cooking, but I had no choice. It's so important that the thigh is tied really tight and trussed, because if it's not, it's not going to bake properly and it's going to fall apart when you cut it. The chicken thigh roll has been in the freezer for 15 minutes. I take that out and uh, start making that brown on a frying pan. I then put it in the oven for another 10 minutes to bake it. What are you up to now? What are you doing now? I'm about to pull the chicken out. Oh, let's have a look at it then. OK. Yeah. Wow, fabulous. Doesn't, you know, it looks good, doesn't it? It looks like it's kept everything in there. There's no juice is spelling out. Doesn't seem so. Yeah, There's a little bit down there. So the big moment comes, of course, when you eventually take it out and find out whether it's cooked perfectly or whether or not you've missed the mark. Yeah, yeah. As soon as my chicken comes out, I want to open it straight away. But I know it has to rest 10 minutes before I can take the top off. George, the guys are taking their chickens out of the oven. Rachel's looks fantastic. It's almost exactly the same as Andrew's. It's beautifully wrapped up in that salt crust. Is it going to be cooked perfectly? Gary, the whole competition comes down to that moment when they lift the lid. Is it cooked? Is it not? Is it spot on? Hearts will be stopping, George. Hearts will be stopping. The potato alley uh, contains a couple of egg yolks, uh, the boiled potatoes, the roasted garlic, and a mixture of olive oil and just normal oil, and then some lemon juice and salt and pepper to taste. I'm pretty happy with it. You have one hour to go. This is make or break. Will you walk away with the title of Celebrity Master Chef? Everything I've worked for throughout this competition all hinges on this last hour, and it's going to decide who wins and who goes home a loser. The garlic is so hot coming out of the oven that I have to use a tea towel to start squeezing it in. Question, how much garlic is in there? Three cloves. Three cloves. Cool. Cloves? Three bulbs. Bulbs. Yep. Three cloves sounds a lot more reasonable. Because cloves are those individual ones. Three bulbs. Well done. <laughs> Good stuff. Were you reading the recipe? Good I stuff, was, then. yeah, but you still scare me, George. Cool. So the all-important moment arises and they have to cut through the crust uh, very carefully. It looks pretty good. I mean, without cutting into it, it's hard to know, but it smells amazing. Time to open the crust on my chicken. Any, any reason why you haven't opened it? And I realised that I've left it in there for 30 minutes, when it should have only been 10. So I am really worried. It's, it's not going to work. So this is a big moment, the moment of truth. Don't. You ready? 
Yum. You happy with it? Very happy, thank you. Yeah, you should be. Good job. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> this is uh, the most nerve wracking bit because if this isn't cooked, this is pretty much the end of my dish. So. All I'm thinking about is the money for my charity, uh, the title of Master Chef, and me failing as a possibility. And I'm really nervous. It's done, I can't worry about it anymore. Um, and now I can focus on plating up the rest of the dish. Half an hour to go and I'm in multitask hell. What, now what are you doing here? Sauteing the veggies. For? I'm making this artichoke bar barragul. Barragul, yeah. Barragul. Yep. Are you sure it needs to be cut that fine for the, for the stock? I shouldn't be chopping them so finely, but I'm chopping them because the recipe says finely diced, but I was reading the wrong part of the recipe. Okay. That there is for this here. This one. Okay, yeah, that's correct. And that's only a tablespoon. Yeah. So I fine. need some more fennel. Yes. I've just wasted all of this precious time in, in dicing all these vegetables. I'm angry. I've got that many pots on the burner. I'm so afraid that I'm going to forget about one thing and it's going to be overcooked or it's going to burn. Kirk, what's happening? What are you up to? Well, I don't really know how to do the burnt butter. Um... OK. Burnt butter's pretty easy. All you're looking for is those little milk solids that are just on the bottom of the pan there because yeah. it's separated, so milk solids and the fat on top. They'll start to colour. They're like little yeah. golden brown kind of... There you go. Yeah, Look, see that? Yeah. So that's probably ready, right. eh? Just there. All right, yeah. so strain that now. OK. I think I've pulled it off. I think I've created a miracle. And somehow, after all the dramas with the dough and the holes and the, the whole stress of it, uh, I somehow have managed to cook the chicken right. You have 10 minutes to go. Come on, guys. Passion will make you crazy, but how else will you want to live? I cut open my chicken breast. It's white, it's moist, it just falls apart. It's exactly how I wanted it. I'm very happy about that element of the dish and it couldn't be any more perfect. I've gone back to just finish off cutting my little finely diced vegetables and I have a look at the uh, recipe and realised it said a tablespoon, not a teaspoon of each. Idiot. I try to remember exactly what Andrew did because the way he presented it was amazing. But I'm not entirely happy with how it's coming out. Uh, it didn't look like the piece of chicken that Andrew had on his dish. Guys, you have five minutes left in this finale. Come on, Kirk. You can do it. You're in danger of forfeiting this round. You need to push this through. I haven't prepped really anything for the plating up. I haven't cut the chicken. I haven't cut the chicken thigh. Yeah. It's just a nightmare. Hearing Kirk having a bit of problems in getting his dish together, I'm slightly happy. But I want to win because I've cooked a better dish, not because someone hasn't plated up. So I'm hoping he gets it on the plate in time. I turned around and I looked at Kirk, and it didn't seem like he was anywhere near plating up. This is the last few moments of this competition, and Kirk is in big trouble. I don't think he's going to make it, George. Yeah, but Rachel, she's come through from behind, and I think she's going to romp at home. Time is just ticking away, literally, and I'm seriously wondering whether I'm going to make it or not. You have one minute to go, one minute. Everything has to be cut so carefully, and I really think now that I'm actually just not going to get there. This is make or break. This is where the competition's going to be won. You have 30 seconds to go. 
I can't really remember how it's supposed to look. I don't know if he used the large vegetables or the small vegetables. I just wanted to make it beautiful. I just start throwing everything on the plate, really. Come on, Kirk, get those vegetables on the plate. Come on, dig deep. Last few seconds. So I'm just sort of placing everything really quickly and realise that I haven't put the diced vegetables in the little stock that I'm meant to have reduced. Everyone else is still busy plating up. I'm just fingers crossed that the clock runs out before they finish. You have 10 seconds to go. I sieve the vegetables out. Nine. Come on, Kirk. Eight. Seven. Get those beans on, Kirk. I've forgotten to put the broad beans in. Six. Now I just grabbed them as hot as they were. Five. Placed them on the plate. Four. It seemed like a really long 10 seconds. Three. Two. I managed to get everything on the plate. One. That's, That's it. it. Step away. Come on. Well done, guys. Well done, guys. Woo! I'm absolutely exhausted. I can hardly stand up. I've never felt more relieved in my, in my life. I slap Rachel's hands, I hug Kirk. Probably should have been the other way around. It's in the hands of the gods. I mean, the judges. Walking into the judges and putting my plate down for the last time, I was really, really proud of how this plate looked. Uh, but, you know, of course, it's mainly down to the taste. Um, we'll see. Kirk? You're neck and neck with Eamon. How do you think you've gone? I think I've done pretty well. Has the experience changed you as a person? The journey for me with Celebrity MasterChef was, I guess, in some ways, more of a personal journey. Um, yeah. You know, I work in a team situation with the band, whereas this was just completely out of my own. And for me, it's been uh, a, a, an amazing achievement, and I really hope I win. Shall we taste? Yeah, let's do it. That chicken breast is absolutely lovely. The flavour through the burnt butter sauce is exactly what you expect it to be. Those lovely toasted, crummy, biscuity flavours through it with a hint of orange, so the balance is, is really good. The, the diced vegetables are crunchy, and that's because you were running out of time. I thought you weren't going to get it on the plate. What's really special about this dish is the chicken. Two beautiful flavours, the breast and the leg, cooked really well. Well done. Thank you. Beautiful looking dish. Perfect Randall's lovely colour around the outside of that pancetta. Beautiful, smooth purees. It just looked impeccable. Thank you. Wanting to take my dish in, I'm all kinds of nervous. The whole journey of Celebrity Master Chef has been a roller coaster. Eamon. I've never seen you stand like that. You always stand with your hands behind your back. You're now hugging yourself. Uh, after that horrible start with the pastry, I mean, I was... I don't think I've ever been as stressed out or close to quitting in my life. You know, you're not a quitter, are you? I'm not a quitter, no, but... I got so, so close, and, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I wasn't going to leave this competition not playing up a dish. Shall we taste? In terms of flavour, the burnt butter sauce is excellent and the aioli has, has got a kick in it, that's for sure. The chicken's got this beautiful barnyard injection of flavour from the, from the hay. It's like lying on top of a haystack summer day. It's warm, 
feel that smell, you want to have a snooze, it's sunny and that's what you're getting, those warm, toasty, summer day flavours. Eamon, thank you very much indeed. See you later. <sighs> thank you. It's now my turn to take my dish into the judges and I'm feeling very emotional. Rachel, you're the underdog. How do you feel about that? Okay, Rachel. I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't cry, and I did, so... <laughs> it's just like... You know, you put your heart into everything, and I'm in the grand final. And when I came into this competition, I just loved food, and I wanted to put in front of you something that I enjoyed doing. Do you feel proud standing in front of that? Absolutely, feel amazing. I mean, there's, it's not perfect and there could be a few minor changes, but it's still good. All right, shall we taste? Thank you. Rachel, what you've done brilliantly with this dish is just put together a little mosaic of ingredients. It looks gorgeous, really, really does. And I think you've done an incredible job. I get really scared of chicken breast. It's one of those cuts of meat that dries out and it's horrid. But that is moist, it's delicious. Like for me, that chicken is the highlight. It's inspirational. That is a brilliant dish, Rachel, well done. Thank you. As an example of how salt crust cookery works on the meat, that is exemplary. That chicken is exactly how I want it to be. For me, the large chunks of veg and the detail of trimming the artichoke is probably where the dish falls down. Mm -hmm. But really well done on those first two elements. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. This is it, when we discover which one of the three of you will become Australia's first celebrity master chef. I'm feeling very anxious. I'm so eager to know who has made it and who has done the best job. It wouldn't be a finale if we didn't invite a few friends back to share in this magnificent moment. It's just great to see some familiar faces again. It's like having sort of, you know, family and friends around when a really important event's about to happen, which of course it is. Celebrity chefs, welcome back to the MasterChef kitchen. And of course, the finale of Celebrity MasterChef. Kirk, Rachel, Eamon, the million dollar question is who? is going to become Australia's first celebrity master chef. I'm just dying to find out, regardless of the result. Time to reveal the scores. Rachel, mm -hmm. you're on 22 points. Yes. Let's see how you've done. Rachel, I scored a dish. Eight out of 10. Rachel, I scored your dish eight out of 10. <laughs> Rachel, I scored your dish eight out of 10. <laughs> Rachel, that's three eights. So you got 24 points from round three. That brings my score to 46 and 
No, I don't think I can win. However, I'm so happy, I'm over the moon, and I'm just so grateful to be here. Yay! <laughs> Kirk, at the end of round two, you had 32 points. Now, to beat Rachel, you need a total of 15 points in round three to take the lead. Kirk, I scored your dish. Seven out of ten. Thanks, man. I scored your dish. Eight out of ten. Kirk, I scored your dish. Eight out of ten. Kirk, you're up to 55 points. You've taken the lead. Fantastic. Well done. It's all down to aim and scores now, and there's definitely some tension in the room. There's some excitement, and I think the nerves have kicked in. Eamon, you're on 32 points. Kirk, you're in the lead on 55 points. Eamon, you need 24 points to take the lead. Eamon, I scored your dish. Nine out of 10. <laughs> Eamon, I scored your dish. Nine out of 10. With only one score to come, I can't describe how much I want this. Eamon, I scored your dish. A nine out of ten. <laughs> Eamon Sullivan, you are Australia's first celebrity master chef. Well done, man. <laughs> George holds up a nine, and I'm Australia's first celebrity master chef. And I didn't know what to do. It's so emotional, and I'm standing there just gobsmacked. So let's look at the final scores. Eamon, 59. Kirk, 55. And Rachel, 46. Well done to all of you. Eamon, how are you feeling, mate? Oh, man, after screwing up that pastry three times, I was so close to quitting today and throwing the towel in and walking out but decided just to, just to play it up and see what I could do. And, you know, I'm so glad I didn't end up throwing that tea towel in and, and having a hissy fit. <laughs> <laughs> Eamon Sullivan, phenomenal swimmer, heartthrob, now to be known as a phenomenal cook. You have won three things. That title, I'm Australia's first celebrity master chef, $50,000 for your nominated charity, which is? Uh, swim, survive, stay alive. A fantastic choice of charity. There's one other thing you get. Eamon Sullivan, come over here. You win the inaugural MasterChef trophy. Middle of the room. Hold it high. Woo! We present to you Australia's first ever celebrity master chef, Eamon Sullivan. I don't want to leave. It's such a great moment. I just realise how involved I have been in this and how much I love cooking, and it's an amazing feeling. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be standing here today as Australia's first celebrity master chef.